recording. Do we have a quorum yet? I'm looking, it looks like we do. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I was just counting, sorry, one, two, three, four, five. Six, yeah, we have one now, Lisa's here. Great. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Grant Management Advisory Committee's uh, quarterly meeting. It, uh, it is Thursday, August 19th, uh, 2021 at 10 a.m. And I am Diane Thorkeldson, the current chair of this illustrious group. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, let's uh, call this meeting to order. And either Cindy or Connie, can you guys do roll call? Sure, uh, I'm happy to do it. This is Connie. Um, Amy Kelly. Leslie Biddleston. Present. Diane Wilkinson. Present. Fernando Serrano. Present. Taylor Holmes. Tom McCoy. Here. Fred Schultz. Casey York. Lisa Janassi. Here. Shirley Trammell. Here. There's a terrible background noise. I'm hearing that. Sounds like static. We need to hear the form of talking. Can you use the line, Cindy? Pardon me? Yeah, never mind. Go on. Amber Boskett. Ali Caliendo. Um, I'm going to do this again. I don't have quorum. Amy Kelly. Here. Shayla Holmes. Fred Schultz. Here. Casey York. Here. Here. Amber Boskett. Ali Caliendo. Here. Perfect. Okay. There you go, Chair. Now we have quorum. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you. Um, we will begin the meeting with a uh, public comment for our first session of public comment. Please remember to uh, keep your public comments to around three minutes. Avoid being duplicative of anybody who has spoken before you and be sure to state your name before you start speaking. And I will open the floor now to anybody with public comment. And as a comment, I just put everybody on mute. So if you're going to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself. This is Diane Thorkelson. Um, I don't hear anybody. We'll give it like two more seconds here to make sure I'm not missing somebody. All right, sounds like we can move on to agenda item number three, which is approval of our minutes from our April 27th meeting. Um, I will um, entertain a motion for approval. This is Leslie, so moved. moved. Fernando, second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Uh, let's move on to agenda item number four, which is our chair election. And I actually will be turning over um, the floor to Stacy York. 
Good morning, and please excuse my voice, Stacy Yard, for the record. The smoke has beat me up and is winning, so forgive me. But um, I guess I start with, is there anybody who um, wants to be the chair or nominate somebody? This is Diane. As Connie said in the meeting notes, I am willing to continue in the role but would um, happily hand over the gavel if there's anybody else interested. Um, this is Amy Kelly. I'd love to nominate Diane Thorkelson. <laughs> this, this, this is, is Leslie, Leslie and I second, second that motion. Yeah, this is Leslie. Perfect, so it sounds like we have a motion from Amy to vote in Diane and a second from Leslie. Is there um, every way, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? All right, passes unanimously. Thank you for, for being our chair again. Yeah, thank you, Diane. You're welcome. <laughs> You've done a this wonderful is, job. Oh, this is I believe Amber Boskett's joined the meeting as well. Great, thank you. Welcome, Amber. Um, let's thank you. Welcome. On to uh, let's see, agenda item number five. We have a series of what I'm really looking forward to: some informational presentations on some uh, programs today. We'll start with our regional mental health co coordinators, um, and we will be joined by a variety of folk today. So I turn the floor over to Connie and invited guests. Um, well, I, this is Connie Lucido. I just wanted to quickly um, um, tell the folks that are listening in um, for their their benefit as well as the committee's benefit. We have um, one of the actually the, the largest chore or task of the grants management advisory committee is that um, you folks are making recommendations on how to spend some of the grant dollars that exist in the director's office, Fund for Healthy Nevada, et cetera. Um, as part of that um, is the review of our biannual needs or biennium needs assessment. Um, and we thought it would be helpful to invite folks that are in the community doing the work to talk about what their priorities are, what their current activities are, um, what are some of the gaps or barriers that they're seeing, and if they had, um, if they were able to make a wish list or or had one thing they could request, what would that be, and and what would that impact be? Um, and so, what you'll see over the course of the next several meetings are presentations similar to this with different topics. Um, so today, you'll see our regional behavioral health coordinators. In just a moment, we also have the Office of Suicide Prevention as well as a community initiative um, that Neighbor Network, as well as some of their partners have been diligently working on. Um, I do intend or I have invited the nutrition group as well as um, tobacco presentations for your next meeting in October. And I'm happy to take any suggestions when we get to the other information or if you in the next few weeks um, think of something that you would like to see um, come to GMAC. We're going to do as many as we can um, because the, the needs assessment is in process right now. It's slated to be in your hands or be published by the January meeting. And then we would want to go through some of those lists of recommendations or, or conversation about it and then um, vote on it in your April meeting. Um, I'm not sure if, if folks are aware of the budget process within the state. I know we just finished legislative session, um, but budgets are due at end of summer next year for the next biennium. So that's, that's why we're looking at these recommendations now. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to introduce the regional behavioral health coordinators. I know there's quite a few and I'm not quite sure who's presenting. So 
So I don't know. This is Dorothy Edwards. I don't know who's driving the slideshow, but if you want to advance to the next one, I will begin and, and provide an introduction. There we go. <laughs> so good after. Well, it's morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dorothy Edwards, the Washoe Regional Behavior Health Coordinator, and I see some faces of old friends back in my state day. <laughs> um, Today we're going to provide you a quick, very high level overview on some of our regional policy board behavioral health priorities that have been identified for promotion support and recommendation pursuant to NRS 433. So okay. priorities and plans shift within each of our regions, generally with each biennium, according to passage of certain bills and of course our needs assessments as well. But these are some items that remain significant within our region. I'm going to talk fast and I apologize for reading, but I'm trying to stay within our, our very strict timeline. <laughs> and so I'm going to um, just be reading. Next slide, please. Support and analysis of where Washoe County is in terms of readiness to stand up a crisis stabilization center remains something on which the board is focused. There have been a number of developments at the national level and within Nevada recently that are focused around addressing behavior health crises. One is the FCC approving 988 as the three digit call line for experiencing a behavior health crisis. This number will go live across the country on July 16, 2022. There are also state resources and some federal Medicaid dollars to help fund the crisis response system. These efforts are all leading to development of a crisis response system for the Washoe region. The regional planning project will design a continuum of services to stabilize and engage anyone experiencing a behavior health crisis and link them with appropriate interventions to address the crisis. The core elements of the crisis response system are a statewide call center, which will also manage the new 988 behavior health crisis line, additional mobile crisis teams, and crisis stabilization programs. The strategy for success for this state supported endeavor began in the 80th legislative session with the introduction and passage of Assembly Bill 66. And then during this most recent biennium, our board <clears throat> bill, Senate Bill 69, was passed as well as several other bills which we supported around behavioral health and crisis response. The board also supports the Community Health Improvement Plan or CHIP developed by the Washoe County Health District. It's a plan of action to address local conditions that are contributing to or causing poor health in Washoe County. One of the focus areas identified by the community was behavioral health with certain activities that are part of our annual report and profile. Next slide, please. So success is not going to be automatic, but gradual over time, but it will happen. We will need the ongoing support and collaboration of state, county and city leadership, which we have. Washoe is no different than the state as we seek to increase our behavior health professional cadre and then provide the subsequent and requisite training. We must remember that a crisis stabilization center does not cure homelessness and the two, homelessness and mental health, are closely aligned. So we still have that to deal with in our region and frankly statewide. While Washoe County remains well poised in some required elements, challenges to success include sustained funding, certain infrastructure and policies and processes required for collaboration between the agencies. But it remains a strong priority for support, not only from our board, but for action within our county. Next slide, please. Equitable focus on substance misuse. So we all know that behavioral health encompasses mental health and substance misuse. There have been some concern expressed that the focus of program funding and policy might be inequitable between the two. Understanding that the two are often co-occurring, we need to work to ensure inclusion and collaboration of all sectors of behavior health. Strategy for success began with the work on an ultimate passage of Senate Bill 69 in this most recent legislative session. Challenges and future activities include participating in the regulations pursuant to the new bill and the recruitment and certification of additional peer support recovery specialists, which of course also impacts our crisis stabilization process project. As we support and continue to need the already established crisis triage center in our region, we also recognize the ongoing need for accountability and solid planning for sustained funding. You hear that word a lot, it's, it's sustained funding. We have many opportunities for one shot, 
but our challenge is getting the sustained funding uh, from, from them. Next slide, please. If we learned anything uh, from this public health crisis, it's that we need a more robust plan and trained staff who can cope with the sometimes overwhelming behavioral health consequences of an emergent event. One strategy for ongoing success was the development of a draft behavioral health annex to our regional emergency plan. We've encouraged and provided resources for training and psychological first aid with the goal to create community response teams to activate when needed during an event. We look forward to conducting drills and exercises with local state and state partners when it's safe and practical to do so. We've also supported and participated in the Nevada Resilience Project through our own Washoe team of crisis counselors who support families and individuals experiencing struggles and challenges due to COVID. Our challenges for this include recruitment and commitment of volunteers to build a solid response team. Always, always a challenge is finding people, <laughs> frankly. Um, I've added housing here specifically in a crisis like COVID where we worked in Washoe County and actually I'm continuing to work with a local agency to provide quarantine housing for our homeless who test positive or who require quarantine and have no, no place to do so. In terms of funding, support for joint exercises and the requisite training will be needed. Also, the continuation of funding for the Resilience Project and is as it has demonstrated significant success in Washoe County. And I have some numbers if anyone ever wants to see that. <laughs> Next slide, please. Finally, I'm doing well. <laughs> the board understands that accurate data around behavior health is necessary to inform trends and assist making decisions. The annual report is a mandate for each region and contains a deeper dive into the material that I'm presenting today. The Behavior Health Profile is a Washoe specific document and contains data from a variety of state, federal, and local sources. But most exciting is the regional behavioral health website that the coordinators are involved in. This was an effort spearheaded by Jessica Flood, want to give her a shout out, the Northern Coordinator. Um, she received some, fun some funding, but this will allow us to meet some statutory recommendations and it's going to provide a one stop. Uh, shop for regional data and it's going to be amazing. We are excited. We work weekly on this to make our one year goal. So you'll be seeing that um, soon. So challenges around data are always ensuring that it's consistent, it's accurate and it's timely from our sources because we rely on what we get from our sources, obviously. So we want to ensure that the website's useful and any reporting we have is accurate. We received funding to get phase one of this project completed, but a desire would be additional funding to sustain it, keep it updated, improve it. I didn't add it here, but we've all agreed, we being the coordinators, that a dedicated data analysis analysts just for the regional behavioral health would be a great use of funding. Um, and we would keep that individual super busy. So, I apologize, I didn't include my contact information. Um, and if you're uh, listening, it's dedwards at washoecounty.us. I know this, I hope, prompted a lot of questions in your mind because I, I felt bad I could probably talk for 30 minutes or an hour and give more detailed information. So please reach out to me. Uh, if you want more information, I can certainly come back at any time that I'm invited. Um, I'm happy to provide uh, further information upon request. Uh, my next presenter, unless you folks have questions for me, um, will be Valerie. And she's actually, I think, going to do double duty and present for two different regions. But um, I am done if you um, want to move on. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is Diane Thorkelson. Thank you, Dorothy, um, for that super quick flyover. Um, <laughs> we appreciate it. Are there any questions from uh, commission members? Um, this is Amy Kelly. I'm just curious if there's any data from other communities that indicates like what is the percentage of our homeless population or of homeless populations relative to the general population that's accessing, I think you called it the 988 line? 
Well, the, this is Dorothy Edwards for the record. Um, the 988 line um, is not, well, actually, I think two, two of our telephone companies may may have enacted it. It, it isn't um, in process yet. It will roll out on July 16th, 2022, whether Nevada's ready or not. We will be ready. I am a part of um, that statewide project. And so actual numbers using 988, we, we don't have. Now, there are data, I don't have it with me, for the population um, that reaches out to our crisis response, our call center. Um, whether we have, and you ask about the homeless that reach out, I, I, I wouldn't think that number probably is high. Now, I have some homeless numbers because I supervise uh, the Wash Almost team. And so, of course, that we, the majority of our folks are homeless that we reach out to unless we're responding with law enforcement. So, you know, I can I can provide some data, certainly, and, and send it to you. I'm not sure it's exactly what you're looking for, but I'm happy to do that. That would be great, Dorothy. I'm just, I'm, I, you know, if we're talking about it as a homeless resource, um, I'm just really, really curious, like, what the utilization rate looks like with any crisis response program that well, Washington County the, currently has. The goal is um, the 988 uh, will roll out, um, and that, of course, was included in SB 390, I think. Don't quote me on that. But um, then that will allow you, if you are in a mental health crisis, instead of calling 911, you'll call 988 and you'll get immediate service. And whether it's the, uh, a mobile response team, a clinician, a peer, or law enforcement, you know, rolling to, to meet your needs, that's what the, the goal will be. Now, does that mean if you call 911, they'll put you on hold and tra no, you know, that hopefully will be a seamless transition. Um, and that's a, a huge task. And of course, we all do know that there will be a fee on our phone bills to pay for that. Um, thanks to Senator Keefer and Ratty and all of those um, bipartisan, uh, it was capped at 35 cents. There are states that as much as a dollar. So, you know, while we may balk at 35 cents, it's better than some states. Um, and I don't know how that will look. So, do, you know, don't ask me. We do have some funding, um, but um, that is how the country intends to pay for it. And when I said there were a couple of phone companies, I think Vonage, uh, an another company, if you were to dial 988, you would get some kind of message and it would transfer you at this point. But I'm happy to come back and give a further report and update um, on that um, and, and yeah, and let me search around for some data, ma'am, you know, to see if it, it's helpful for you and, and we can talk offline um, anytime you want. Uh, and and just so so you folks know, this is Connie Lucido. We, um, uh, um, as Dorothy had, had referenced SB 390, this is all very, very new and is still in the planning stages. Um, I, I do intend to request Dr. Woodard um, to provide overview of those those uh, activities, and she'll she'll be amazing. <laughs> she is our resident <laughs> expert for sure. This is Diane Thorkelson. Any other questions from commission members? Hearing none, thanks, Dorothy. Um, that was very informative. And I think you said that your colleague, Valerie, will be stepping in now. Good morning. This is Valerie Quape Haskin, Rural Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity today. Jessica Flood is actually in, she's traveling right now, so she is not able to attend. So she asked me to fill in for her. Um, so we'll be kind of sandwiching our two presentations together. So um, she asked me to really focus on the board priorities and the funding priorities of her slides. So first, really obtain the sustainable funding for the current, current crisis stabilization centers and jail diversion programs. So we're talking about most programs, FAST, CIT, and of course the Mallory Crisis Center in Carson City. Second, to increase behavioral health workforce and the capability to treat adults and youth. This is something that she and I are both seeing across both of our regions. Um, we just don't necessarily have 
the staffing to fill open positions when there is funding available. Um, and there can be difficulty in uh, recruiting. Um, she, just kind of as a side note, a lot of the organizations that she and I work with end up having of providers and professionals in order to recruit them to come out to our communities. Um, particularly the, the further out they are, the more so. So um, any funding that can help support um, paying for these providers and increasing services uh, would be greatly beneficial to these communities. Increasing access to treatment in all levels of care, increasing access to affordable and supported housing, um, housing is a shortage across Nevada, as well we're well aware, but particularly in our mining communities and other rural communities where um, there may be a fair number of people kind of having this influx as mining and other resources ramp up and also as people are pushed out of the metro areas of Reno and Carson specifically. Develop services to support continuity of care. So looking at ensuring that people have continuation of medication and service connections um, with a community health worker when they're moving from one aspect of the behavioral health system to another. All right, next slide, please. So the Northern Board is in the process of developing this mental health um, system. So we, they already have the crisis, Mallory Crisis Center um, and CCBHCs, and, but looking to also further develop these um, different um, access points as well as assertive community treatment teams, working with the, um, those teams and making sure that those are interwoven with the FAST teams as well. Next slide, please. So the gaps are really access to care for youth and adults. Um, again, ensuring that we have that behavioral health workforce to meet the needs. 24-7 in-person outreach for individuals in chronic crisis. Supported housing and support for COVID-induced risk factors such as isolation, unemployment, grief, and loss. Next slide, please. Um, I'm actually not really going to get into her activities. Um, I know that she's been working on, and she and her board have been working on the emergency operations planning. Um, she's also really, as Dorothy said, been spearheading this process to build out a comprehensive website for all five of the policy boards. Um, and the Northern Board is very interested in being the first to kind of test pilot this concept of having a regional behavioral health authority, identifying how this might actually work. Next slide, please. So looking at the funding needs, so further funding for crisis response infrastructure development. So we need more funding for crisis services, including something for youth. The youth are largely left out when resources are developed across, particularly the, uh, well, across the state, but particularly in our rural communities. Having these satellite crisis response units that are e more easily accessible to communities that are further out. Um, increasing the number and availability of mobile crisis teams, and of course, behavioral health transportation to and from services. Um, also funding for the behavioral health emergency response plan. So getting together a, and um, testing it out through a joint exercise, um, providing training for these response teams, and then funding for the publication of these materials and also ensuring that they have the, the materials to, um, to complete the trainings. Additionally, funding for the Behavioral Health Authority formalization. So um, funding for technical assistance, reaching out to other states that have already tested this as well, um, potentially bringing in some contractors for um, assistance and data coordinator, coordinator position and program evaluation. Just as Dorothy mentioned, this is something that could be incredibly valuable to all of us. Um, it's sometimes difficult for the state to kind of be able to keep up with our, our data needs. And we also need to be able to work with our local stakeholders directly to uh, teach them how to collect data. And so having someone who's got their hands in deeply rooted in both the state data collection and evaluation and able to work with local partners um, and help provide technical assistance would be very valuable. Uh, next slide, please. If you have any questions about any of her requests, please, please reach out to her directly, uh, jessica at nrhp.org. All right, and I think that's it for hers. 
Um, so my region is Elko, Eureka, Humboldt Landing, Pershing, and White Pine counties. So I have all that space from Lovelock to Utah up to Idaho, and um, I think a little bit of Oregon as well. Um, the size of my region is actually just slightly larger than the state of Mississippi, and our population is hovering around 100,000. So my board's priorities moving into 2021 include transportation, um, again, to and from both crisis uh, services as well as to regular outpatient appointments. Um, there's a huge lack and a huge need for that in our region. Increases in Medicaid and preferably CMS reimbursement for behavioral health services. As I mentioned previously, there's a larger cost associated with keeping providers on board. Um, also, as inflation happens, um, just the general costs of doing business are also increasing and the reimbursements have not been keeping up in the past, but they are certainly not doing so now. With behavioral health workforce development, we've noticed um, really more poignant um, lacks in providers across our region. So the board passed SB 44 this last legislative session to improve paths to licensure for experienced behavioral health providers coming to Nevada from out of state, as well as to um, help improve some of the um, professional internship program hours processes so that our students who are living in rural communities can stay there instead of having to leave for more urban communities or go out of state. We've already discussed data quality. Um, again, making sure that we have timely data and that also I think we need to work more with our local level stakeholders to ensure that they are um, trained to collect the data properly. Um, that is something that I've noticed they really get kind of hung up on. And as you are probably aware, if you've worked with any rural communities, there's not necessarily a history of data-driven decision-making. So that's one of the things that we're really working on is trying to shift that culture. Um, with that comes improving interagency communication and partnership within counties, communities, and across the region and with the state and providing and finding options for more services for youth, um, the elderly and other minorities, including um, American Indians and Alaskan natives. Uh, we have a lot of tribal communities in our region and we wanna make sure that they are being served properly. Last but not least, there's very little resources available for veterans within our region. Uh, VA provides services, but they have to go to Reno or Utah for uh, behavioral health services. And so that's really not feasible for a lot of our veterans service members and their family members. Next slide, please. I promise this is my last slide. Um, so our funding priorities from there is increased Medicaid reimbursement for behavioral health treatment, funding to support most both in-person and virtual programs as well as CRT in our rural communities. And what I mean by our virtual programs is we do have interest from law enforcement to fully access the care team, which already stands up by the state. Um, but in working with the care team, there's concerns that they may not have the resources to support the volume of calls they would be getting if they were fully integrated with law enforcement. And if law enforcement, for example, had like a tablet with them that they could use when they encounter somebody in crisis. So really bolstering that program so that they can meet that need, as well as obviously providing seed money for most programs to be piloted in our other communities. Increased Medicaid reimbursement for behavioral health transportation, both inpatient and also outpatient services. Increased youth treatment and prevention and promotion services, both in and out of schools. With the exception of Pershing County, the availability of youth services in across my region is terrifyingly lacking. Um, increased funding for behavioral health treatment and recovery for veterans in rural communities. Funding to pilot rural crisis stabilization centers and novel crisis programs designed to meet the needs of rural communities. Humboldt General Hospital is trying to build out a crisis center, but I know that funding is always an issue and particularly when we're looking at sustainability. So getting that up off the ground and also moving forward long term. Increased funding and priority given to behavioral health programming for elderly adults. I believe Misty will be presenting after the coordinators will and she and I were talking about suicide rates and the suicide rates among our elderly populations is alarmingly high and they are consistently left out of programming. Um, next slide, please. So if you have any questions, please contact me. Um, this is my email. Um, and does anybody have any questions before I pass the baton to Teresa? 
uh, this is Tom McCoy. I have a question, Valerie. Um, is there a typical average uh, travel distance factor for a provider, a psychiatrist, for example, in these areas? I'm just curious. I'm on the Network Adequacy Advisory Council for the uh, Division of Insurance, and I'm always interested in in that in that factor that uh, impacts behavioral as well as uh, traditional medical help in our rural areas. Um, thank you, Tom. That's a great question. So to my knowledge, we don't have any psychiatrists located specifically in my region. Um, and so with that being said, Lovelock is about hour, hour and a half from Reno, and then Ely is about five hours from Reno um, and about three and a half hours from Vegas. So for their services, they usually end up going to Vegas or sometimes to Salt Lake City. Elko usually goes to Salt Lake City or Twin Falls, Idaho. Um, so we've got a lot of interstate issues going on there. Um, so if we're able to get more providers that are located at least within the region and a, a more easily commutable distance, that might help some of that cost and uh, continuation of care because we know there is communication issues when we're looking at out-of-state providers trying to network with in-state providers. I'm sorry, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, is telehealth going to help? Um, yes, to a certain extent. Um, it depends on the population. So the providers, or I'm sorry, the, the community members in my region were really um, anti-telehealth until COVID hit. And then kind of being forced to learn how to use Zoom and other platforms made that a lot easier. Um, however, when, particularly when we're looking at the elderly populations, they're going to be a lot more comfortable working with people one-on-one -on -one and face-to-face -face than over any sort of technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Leslie. I just have a question about workforce um, development. How much of the problem with workforce development is like salary related, like we're not paying enough to attract people from out of state or we're not paying enough to keep our, our new um, students past a year or so? I would say both. <laughs> um, also with new students, it's there's also costs associated with having a supervisor and sometimes even taking a pay cut in order to complete internships. Um, so I think if there were some if, if there was some sort of grant or stipend program to help bolster the financial support for students who are trying to complete their clinical licensure within Nevada and particularly within our rural areas, that would be incredibly helpful with kind of helping those soon to be providers network within the community, get their feet underneath them, um, build those relationships with people in their communities who need care and uh, and really stay after that is over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is Diane, any other questions? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Valerie. And, Thank you. Um, now we will hear. I you said your colleague's name, and I can't remember it. Um, but the representative from Clark County. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. I am Teresa Chaberry. I am an assistant manager with Clark County Social Service, and I oversee housing programs and our behavioral health unit. Uh, we do have a new behavioral health coordinator. Uh, Michelle Bennett, but she is uh, a week and a half into her new job, so I didn't want to tell her that she had to do this presentation. Um, I uh, ditto all of the other coordinators' um, uh, gaps and needs and, and assets um, that we are looking for. All of what they said before, it's a running theme with all of our coordinators with all of our in all of our regions. But one of the things that is most, uh, I think, important here in Clark County is the need for um, behavioral health services uh, for our uh, people experiencing homelessness. 
Not that we we have over 5,000 individuals in Clark County at any given day that is homeless, but I think the really the crux of a lot of the situations, in addition to housing, uh, affordable housing, and more housing programs, is also behavioral health services. Over half of our homeless population has a behavioral health issue, and I think that it's important for us to really look at how our homeless population accesses the uh, behavioral health services and look at it in a in a different way so that we can provide health uh, health pro provide behavioral health services in a more formal setting to have behavioral health services where our homeless populations are we have um, a nonprofit agency that does mobile crisis uh, intervention with our homeless population to get them to uh, uh, to services to help them uh, understand what housing uh, what housing is available and that team has told me over and over again that it takes between eight to ten contacts with that homeless individual before them to realize that maybe they want to be sheltered and they want to be in a program and they want to start um, housing with case management services. So having um, we have medical mobile uh, we have uh, mobile health care uh, units that go out from the School of Medicine from UNLV and for Toro and Toro University. They have big buses that they are in the homeless corridor working with the homeless population, addressing some of their health care needs. And I would say that maybe we should look at having some behavioral health services there to do a touch point, obviously not to do ongoing therapy, but to really talk with individuals, have a touch point, um, get them to understand um, that behavioral health services are not a necess uh, not a scary thing and and sort of sort of invite them into wanting to talk about some of the issues that they may be having and then being able to transfer them on to more formal uh, types of behavioral health services. Next slide, please. So the activities that we have been involved with is the same thing with uh, the regional, the other regional coordinators. We've been working with the website on a weekly basis so that we can have information for everyone in our regions to understand what behavioral health services are, what resources are available to them, and give them an opportunity to sort of connect on a local level with uh, behavioral health resources. Um, obviously, I am very, um, vetted into discharge planning uh, regarding homeless individuals. Uh, a lot of our hospitals and our jails often do not want to discharge to the street. A lot of times hospitals do not want to discharge to someone to the street or to the to the shelter because they need post hospitalization care. And so one of the uh, one of the things that our region is working on is looking at medical respite services to get someone from the hospital to a medical respite so that their post hospitalization care can be addressed either medically or behavioral health and then move them on to some type of housing program. I also work with the resilience ambassadors who um, have been working very diligently here in Clark County. They have been in social Clark County social service with the Southern Nevada Health District, with our community agencies, with Boys and Girls Clubs, and with the Harbor, which is a juvenile justice assessment center that works with families and, um, teen and, and transitional age youth. And we've had in the month of July alone, we've had almost 12,000 calls that they have uh, had encountered working with, uh, working with uh, families and individuals that are in crisis due to COVID. Next slide, please. So our, um, our regional behavioral health policy board funding priorities is uh, really to have stable funding for transitional and crisis intervention services for children and adults. Um, that includes um, uh, emergency management protocols. It, it includes um, creation and development and sustainability of mobile crisis teams in our community. Also, uh, residential treatment, we would like to have more community-based services to support uh, uh, families and their children so that they are not into, uh, put into residential treatment. And then the other, I think, is something that I know is in statute, but all of our coordinators have really talked about it, that we really 
would like to get ongoing data um, to get a civil commitment that includes everything from law enforcement, transport um, to emergency rooms um, and uh, from the court system as well. That concludes my um, presentation and uh, the contact information is there and the new Clark Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator, uh, Michelle Bennett, that is her um, email address. And if you have any further questions, you can email both of us and we would be more than happy to give you information. Thank you, Teresa. Um, this is Diane Thorkelson. Any questions from commission members? All right, hearing none, I want to thank um, all of the coordinators for their presentation this morning. That was very um, informative and hopefully we'll be hearing back from you as we move through our needs assessment and funding recommendations and all the stuff that the GMAC does. Um, thanks for your efforts and let's look at our agenda. Um, the next presentation will be by uh, Ms. D the, um, from the Office of Suicide Prevention. Good morning, Good morning everyone. The floor is sorry, yours. Sorry, I had... Am I off Am mute? I off mute? I've got a terrible echo. We can hear you, echo. but there's a really terrible echo. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what's happening there. Uh, how's that? That's much better. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. I, I thought this impacted my phone. It's different with every platform. Yes. So thank you. It's such a delight to um, present in front of you all. Connie, thank you so much. And Cynthia, thank you for your assistance. And I'm so pleased to follow all our wonderful behavioral health coordinators, because as you can see, we do work very closely with all of them. But when they present their regional needs, uh, it really impacts suicide prevention. So you're going to hear a lot of similarities, even though we did not work on this together. I, I'm just the comprehensive and uh, comprehensiveness and continuity of their plans is really a powerful force for our teamwork together across the state. So if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. This is the current state of the Office of Suicide Prevention. We are statewide. We began in 2005 and we currently receive Fund for Healthy Nevada funding, as you can see, that has not shifted um, since our implementation in 2005. We have two zero suicide coordinators now, thank goodness, one in the north um, who is kind of the oversight for the state and a new zero suicide coordinator in the south. Those coordinators are funded through our statewide opioid response funding and some other opioid funding. So there's a lot of that um, overlap, which makes so much sense when it comes to overdose, accidental or intentional. We really work together on that. We support crisis support services and have since about 2001 with about $100,000 for their hotline, but they have recently received much more as they're implementing and building towards the 988 um, overarching plan, which is really exciting. And we received Project AWARE funding from the Department of Education last year for a five-year grant with Project AWARE for school-based mental health services our piece of that for the Office of Suicide Prevention is training. Mental health literacy, awareness, and suicide prevention focused training for 90% of school staff, 50% of the students, and 10% of families in the pilot schools that we're working with in Carson City, Washoe County School District, and the Charter School Authority. So we are just ramping up after a planning year. We have one position, which is me, the coordinator, funded with the general fund, three state positions with the Fund for Healthy Nevada, and then everyone else is grant contracted. So as you've heard from our, our coordinators, uh, that sustainability is really crucial. What works for suicide prevention is comprehensive, ongoing, early intervention, ideally, and prevention strategies. And with the grants, it's just onboarding. It's implementing its evaluation, but we never keep that sustainability. So that consistency of message you're hearing is um, really important. And we scrape by a lot of our work with interns and volunteers. We are really gifted with wonderful interns, especially from the School of Public Health Sciences and the School of Social Work. But my, my person in Las Vegas has never had an official assistant. 
and he is the lone person to do that entire valley. So that kind of support would be greatly impactful on this office. Next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a really quick update. 2019 data, our most recent data, Nevada had the highest rate in the nation. Uh, we've been out of the top 10 only twice, where we, we were 11th in the nation. And you've probably heard this time and again, it's the leading cause of death for our youth. And not just Nevada, other states, this is a huge issue across the nation with our young people's mental health challenges and crisis. And as Valerie had mentioned, our Nevada elders have one of the highest rates in the nation, and they have for decades. We have slipped out of the top here and there, but it's not consistent. And so you'll hear me speak about the gap, which does include our Nevada veterans. So every behavioral health coordinator mentioned data and analytics. This seems to be an ongoing issue when I'm talking about 2019 being our most recent data. We, we are aware of trends, but because they need to be verified and analyzed properly, we kind of miss opportunities especially in our smaller communities where it is hard to get that data with small populations and safely share and report on it. So you're going to hear me again, data support and analytical support would be great. Next slide, please. These are initiatives we've had from our first state strategy in 2007. So just an example, we do partner with agencies and schools for early identification and screening. Our most successful event is Washoe County School District mandates screening with signs of suicide for all seventh graders. Last year, they had parent approval, parent permission for about 70% of their students, which is remarkable with this kind of program. And I think they're going to see that even increase for this coming year. They have booked already all of their schools for screening. This program has grown beautifully because there's also parent outreach. That has been a gap getting our parents and guardians in the room because they're truly the support system to keep their young ones safe if they are screened for mental health challenge or suicide. And so one of our huge initiatives for Office of Suicide Prevention in our new strategy is postvention support. You might have heard postvention as after a loss to suicide and we have support groups, but truly we see postvention as prevention and we are building programs with community partners to be in that hospital when that young person has made an attempt. Give that family immediate resources for support for when their young person comes home, because that is a very scary time. And then build out with the Office of Suicide Prevention and other partners ongoing support for the support systems, which really fits in with all of the crisis systems you've heard from the behavioral health policy board. It's, it's a system of support from the moment they get into crisis help, but also coming out and in their ongoing recovery really an important thing I think we're all working towards. These are all the trainings we've done. And amazingly with COVID, we shifted to virtual almost immediately because most of our trainings are face-to-face. -face. And we miss that because to really impact confidence, confidence that face-to-face -face practice is crucial. But we had incredible silver linings with accessing communities that maybe never could get to a training virtually. And there's a certain intimacy with virtual trainings. So, so we trained thousands during the COVID year. And just, it's really wonderful to keep reaching out to new audiences and those that might never have thought suicide prevention was their business, but it is. We work still closely with the hotline and are part of all of their planning for 988, so I won't stick with that. Um, next slide, please. We work, as you just mentioned, you've heard all the regional behavioral health policy boards. They really educate and guide our office where we need to, to focus and shift or build partnerships. So they are just such great wealth of knowledge and support. And then Zero Suicide is just expanding. In the first few years, Sherilyn Rarwood had 16 healthcare facilities, be it behavioral health or hospital facilities or rural clinics, working on what Zero Suicide is, leadership, top-down training, Right now, they're moving into policy development with each of their individual um, entities. So this is a huge place of growth for the future. And when I mentioned sustainability, you can imagine a big hospital system trying to take all of this on, especially during COVID, that technical assistance, consistency of support, and trusted relationships makes all the difference in the world. And that's why I really want to bring up sustaining zero suicide 
will be an ongoing wish from here and forever. And so if we could get out of that grant cycle, I think it will impact our behavioral health crisis system and impact suicide rates eventually. And then we do have the committee to review suicide fatalities where we do find out grants, um, more timely data, but not timely enough. And we are shifting in that to partner with opioid response, opioid overdose deaths, the, the fentanyl crisis that's happening right now. That is being looked at and examined if we can have a partnership there. Next slide, please. I am not going to go into all of these, but I wanted you to see the reach our office um, has. It, it is lifespan, it is all communities. We have incredible initiatives with our service members, veterans, families through one governor's challenge team and three mayor's challenge team. Elko, Valerie's region has a mayor's challenge team, Las Vegas with Teresa's um, area, and then Truckee Meadows with Reno and Sparks. And we are pulling them together on similar initiatives such as reducing access to lethal means, um, you hear time and again, accessing care, having enough workforce, especially with our veterans, especially in the rural communities. So this will be an ongoing initiative for Nevada. Uh, our, our leadership really supports this moving forward and our teams are enormous with support from the communities. Next slide. The pandemic, we did a lot. I, I'm only putting this up here because we, we received some CARES funding at the end of last year and had to spend more in six weeks than we get in an entire year. And so I put all these slides up here on purpose because when we have that support and funding, it's amazing what we can do, even in six weeks. And one of the real beautiful gifts that came out of that funding is the Resilience Project and our Resilience Ambassadors. They've been just tremendous supports in the community. We had the privilege of training them in crisis intervention and suicide prevention, so got to know them very well. And if there's a way to sustain that program, I think it benefits all Nevadans. We are also doing a new um, outreach effort with uh, faith leaders in caring communities. We know there are lots of traditional resources for help, but those natural community supports, especially in Nevada and our rural communities are crucial. And we have to lift them up, give them the technical assistance and support as they care for their community members. Next slide, please. This is our new plan draft. We have been working on it way too long, but every time I look at it, I see new changes and new shifts. But a call to action for suicide prevention came out in, in January of 2021, so it really shifted my focus. And these are our eight new goals that we just love. And although it's not an official plan, we have already been implementing and accomplishing many of these goals. But as you can see, the number one is surveillance and data, because if we don't have that, how are we knowing how to do the rest of these? We have never properly evaluated Nevada strategies or the work OSP has done. So I, I would see that as a really important piece, especially for a committee like yours making these difficult decisions. I would love to show you more concrete information of the impact we have made. Upstream factors are really important. You heard about the transportation needs, the housing needs, that is suicide prevention, economic support, it's those basic needs that can really impact risk for suicide, the day-to-day -day stressors exacerbating maybe other mental health challenges. So upstream is something we, we just continually to, to work on, bringing everyone into this role. And goal four really is focused on that zero suicide effort. And they, they just are a wildfire across our healthcare system because it does work. We do partner closely with the crisis care and transitions which a lot is being led by the 988 planning because we need that system so that when they do call that number, the safe help is there. And then I mentioned, um, again, my favorite goal eight, the new post pension programming. It really is lacking, not just in Nevada, but across the nation on help for those support systems. If we can keep our homes safe, not just with lethal means safety, but also feeling that connection, building that connection, knowing where to go and how to get there will save lives. Next slide, please. I do not expect you to read all this. This was just things we did over the past year, again, with that extra care funding, and it allowed us to meet different populations, reach out, create um, programs, begin implementation, such as with our Native American communities. We are just starting to help a, a community that's had a hard time during COVID. 
And there's no quick answers, but we learn, we go and listen and we keep showing up. So these next two slides are just the opportunities we want to keep building upon for the Nevada Office of Suicide Prevention. The next slide. And I believe you'll have these to read through slowly. Uh, but you can see there's a lot going on in our tiny little office, and we haven't even hired the Project Aware people yet. We're just in that process. So we'll be doubling our office for the first time in 16 years. Next slide. These, this was the upstream um, things I thought it would be interesting for you to know. This is that more comprehensive suicide prevention that the Behavioral Health Policy Board committees and their coordinators work on as well. And if we can keep growing that upstream, um, the crises will diminish, there'll be more security. And my final slide, my final two slides, the barriers and wishes. You're hearing the same thing, the face-to-face walk-in crisis support. Our hotline is wonderful, but we also know that connection um, face-to-face seems to be growing at what people need. And with the stabilization units, they call it like that living room model, where it's really a very therapeutic, less traumatic circumstance. And most people can de-escalate their own crises um, with that kind of support, peer support. And then those that need acute care, there will be space and time for that. Mobile crisis, especially for our adults, really incredible gift when people, case managers, law enforcement officers, mental health professionals, whatever that mobile crisis team is built like, show up there with kind, well, well-trained, to be that support and peer support as well. I think I've said enough about the post mention after attempts awareness. We just have never had the funding for great awareness campaigns. I do think now's the time. Uh, if we aren't experiencing crisis, we know someone who is. So how do we let them know what is working out there? What are those connections to build safety and support? The high risk groups you've heard uh, are working, working age. It's hard to connect with them. Um, they aren't the ones seeking help. So that's a big gap I will see. Uh, Colorado's done some amazing work with something called man therapy. So we, we keep in touch with those doing the great work, but we have never had the resources to accomplish that. And then our elders, that is something we, we just, it's never in the budget. The grants are rarely there, but there are great ideas to help our elders. Um, Washoe County did something recently with um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to build connection. and. Um, remove isolation, and that right there is suicide prevention. And then never enough information with our Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. We started with one town hall meeting last year. It was the first. We intend as the Office of Suicide Prevention to have biannual meetings because we have so much to learn and so many barriers to break down there. So that would be a huge gap I would look for some support on. And the final slide with the wish list, I've probably said it way too many times already, um, sustainable staff. We have four staff to do this whole state and all those activities. The zero suicide staff and the project aware youth staff would be incredible. But to have a focused youth person to really work with the districts in the Department of Ed, you know, would be incredible. And the Department of Ed has just been a great partner. And then a focused staff for zero suicide, because as I said, healthcare will always have a need for this work. And if we can sustain that continuity, um, it would be great. And then finally, you know, we, we don't do well with our reporting and our state planning. Um, others have funding for professional work and professional support. So I would always look for that kind of support to improve our products out there. And I believe that was my final slide. So the next should be the contact information of all of our staff. If you want to connect with anyone, whether you're worried about someone or you want some information, they are wonderful resources for you. And I look forward to your question. This is Diane Thorkelson. Thank you, Misty. Um, any questions from commission members? Uh, yes, this is Leslie. I have a question and a comment. Um, and my question is um, just for my understandings, Early on in the presentation, did you say juveniles were referred to the harbor for services? I did not. I did not mention the harbor in this presentation. I know oh. they are a great resource for support. Um, my colleague Richard Egan does work with them quite a lot. They have incredible data collection. I know we have um, observed their work, but I did not mention that in this presentation. Is, is there a question specific to the harbor? 
No, no, not specific to the harbor. I was just wondering where the juveniles fit into this whole piece. <laughs> well, we, we, the, our youth suicide um, is it's the leading cause of death for our youth. But we work closely with the Department of Education and our school districts and community partners. So I'm not sure what you heard. We, we do signs of suicide with several of our school districts. Um, Pershing County uses signs of suicide. Washoe, as I mentioned, all seventh graders are offered screening and education. The resources for help will vary with community. And we're building through screening, building that route from the young person having a, a mental health concern or thoughts of suicide, where, where our office wants to work is building that support for the, the support system. One of my favorite conversations is calling a parent and saying, I know this is scary, but we are going to help you help your, your child stay safe. They instantly know they're not being judged. They're not alone. And how do we keep supporting them when that young person has to come home? It's, it's very scary, but there's tools out there to support them. And there's other agencies training support systems. We know it, it can make all the difference. Okay. So I don't okay. think that answered your question. It, it kind of answers my question. And my comment is around mo mobile crisis. Um, whereas I agree that mobile crisis is an is a excellent resource, my concern is mobile crisis only comes out um, when people are starting to show signs of um, something and they are not appropriate or they do not come out when somebody is in a full-blown um, manic state. Um, so when you talk about expanding the, the services for mobile crisis, is this really looking at expanding to using them for this is, you know, when somebody is in a manic state, because what usually happens is we call the police and the police are even worse at handling somebody in a manic state. So I guess that's a really strange question, but it's really expanding using mobile crisis to those people when they are really, really need the help and when they are really in that manic state. Actually, Leslie, thank you for that question. I, I it is not strange in my brain. I, I completely okay. respect where you are. And I think we are building that. We are hearing from people partnering with NAMI. You know, there's NAMI, Western Nevada, NAMI, statewide NAMI, you know, Southern Nevada. They have a wonderful warm line where they don't have to be in crisis to call. They might be getting out of the hospital and need a little extra support as they're in recovery, or they might have been in isolation with COVID. It's different than the crisis hotline, you know, for the 988. But that whole continuity of care is important. And with 988, we know that that mobile crisis is crucial. We're not there yet. So I, I think hearing what you, you're saying and experiencing is, is taking that into consideration and in how we move forward. Because there are current teams with, with law enforcement and mental health, and they're fabulous. But there are other states who don't have law enforcement connection to those mobile teams, and that might look different. It, it might be peer support and a therapist or a therapist in case manager. So I think there's lots of looks for that mobile team. And I will say with crisis intervention teams within law enforcement, they're specially trained for these circumstances. And I know not all law enforcement agencies have been able to, to do that training or have time because it does take a lot of time and, and funding. And some, some communities are smaller, but building on those programs, I think will, ultimately improve those interactions. So we need to keep sharing those experiences and, and, and learning from those that you're hearing. So I appreciate that. And yes, and, and I'm, I work on the juvenile side and I'm hearing a lot of, you know, um, community homes that are, they are staffed by people that are not equipped to handle kids in crisis. So they are trying to call mobile crisis and they won't come out and then they call the police and then the police just make the situation worse. So, and they don't have anywhere to take them other than to the hospital. So I guess there's that piece that are missing, especially around these juveniles. And um, I would really love to see something, you know, in place to where we can help these kids in crisis, not as they're escalating, but they're already there. And um, so that's a lot of what I've heard. And um, 
So, so I appreciate you listening and, and, and sharing what your goals are or thoughts. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we need to keep the spotlight on that because the building of this entire crisis system is to prevent what you, what you're experiencing. And it is being discussed at all levels in all communities. So that, as you can imagine, it's, it's a big shift for Nevada, especially, um, but, but the, the legislation is there to support some of this. So that's the exciting part. And, and these, um, our regional behavior health coordinators have the pulse of their communities to move this forward. So thank you again for that. Anything else? This, this is Diane Thorkelson. Any other questions from the committee members? Sometimes I give way too much information and it gets muddy. Sorry about that, you guys. That's OK. All right, hearing none. Thank you, Misty, for your time today. Thank you all. Uh, and for the great work that you have always been doing <laughs> in this arena for the state of Nevada. Um, let's move on to agenda item number seven, which is a presentation um, by Valerie and Amy regarding the Neighborhood Network of Northern Nevada. So the floor is yours. Hello. Hello, this is Amy. Oh, sorry, Valerie. I'm going to do a quick introduction because I actually have to log off and cover something that came up for work. So um, really quick, just wanted to introduce myself, Amy DeWitt Smith. I'm the executive director of the Neighbor Network of Northern Nevada. We go by N4 for short. Um, we are actually past grantees of um, FHN funds and both for respite services as well as our transportation program. So I thought it would be nice to come back and just share an update. And um, I think it's always helpful for um, our partners and funders to know what, what happens after we get that little bit of support. So um, I will let Valerie, our partner at Phoenix Mobility Rising, go into more detail about our statewide transit project. Um, and I just wanted to really quick you know, pitch that N4 does have a variety of um, programs and projects across Northern Nevada in 12 separate counties. Um, we have a time exchange program uh, that anybody can join and, and help out their neighbor. We also have a pretty robust volunteer program. Uh, our in-house transportation program um, is in Washoe County specifically. And then uh, also our community care program where we provide uh, in-home and really community focused uh, respite care support for people with disabilities and older adults um, using paid staff so it's not a voucher system um, you know outreach with the pandemic has been really challenging so i know there are a lot of um, community organizations and, and partners on the call so if you if you know of an adult with a disability 18 and up or an older adult who um, needs care services please uh, reach out to me because we'd love to get connected and and provide that support I'll go ahead and put my contact information in the chat before um, I log off. And with that, I want to introduce Valerie Leffler of Phoenix Mobility Rising to talk about our statewide project. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy, for the introduction and for the support and the opportunity to work on this project. Um, so Phoenix Mobility Rising, we are a nonprofit. We work across the United States on mobility projects, and our mission is creating mobility solutions for the health and well-being of every person in every community. And here on the call today, just listening to the presentations ahead, you know, supporting individuals in crisis, behavioral health, suicide prevention, et cetera, transportation is a big part of getting to those resources. And so we're honored to have the opportunity to enhance uh, connectivity of the services that are out there and help provide um, connected thought leadership um, around bringing together more resources as those opportunities are available. Um, go ahead and next slide, please. So N4 Connect is um, starting out for the first two years, connecting 13 transportation agencies across northern half of the state and really making sure that the services that are out there are visible and aware to case managers, social workers, um, as well as individuals and caregivers in the community, um, providing data. So if somebody searches for pick up and a drop off address and there's no service available, we track that as well as if they're requesting a ride and the ride happens or if they request a ride and the ride doesn't happen. All of that is happening in the same data ecosystem. 
And we, our main goal is to increase access for individuals, caregivers, and social service agencies with the transportation resources. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Oh, go ahead. Was there a question? Okay. So um, one of the things that is happening with this pilot and bringing all these transportation pl platforms and providers together is, is called mobility as a service. And it's a new context. A lot of times they call this the Netflix of transportation where all your programs are under one app. Um, so we're, we're launching uh, the Netflix of transportation um, in Northern Nevada, bringing together the transportation providers, but not for the sake of saying, ooh, we have a really cool app, but for the sake of making a difference and increasing access to all social determinants of health. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is just the map of the 12 counties that we're working in to start out with, White Pine, Eureka, Elko, Lander, Churchill, Pershing, Humboldt, Washoe, Story, Lyon, uh, Douglas, and Carson City. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is currently the transportation agencies that we're collaborating with with the platform. Thank you, Stacy. She's on the call here today on the committee. Um, her pr uh, program is also part of this service, um, but really bringing together all of these transportation agencies in a one-stop shop, whether that be an online portal or a app portal, enabling individuals to request a ride or learn about the services in one place and engage in that knowing what service areas they have, what the rates are, what the pickup time and the drop-off time is. A lot of times when we work with um, professionals in the healthcare industry, especially case managers spend a lot of time trying to secure the right transportation. Um, and sometimes it can involve making nine, 10, 11 phone calls for a single patient. And what we like to do is bring those resources under one umbrella and provide that information. Uh, next slide, please. This is a picture of our kickoff meeting that we had, um, I think it was the last week in June in Reno, and then images across the state uh, where we went and did site visits for folks who wasn't able to come to the meeting, um, was able to drive from Eureka, White Pine, um, uh, Battle Mountain, all over, and to really meet folks um, that were gonna be a part of this program. I'm one of those folks where I'm, when I work with partners, I like to shake their hand. I like to meet them. I like them to meet me and for us to work together in as a team. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the great things about Phoenix Mobility Rising working across the U.S. And, and around the world in this industry is we can bring this global technology focus. And so we literally went to the other side of the globe to find a technology partner that really has the breadth and the depth to provide a resource that is needed. Um, and so Australia is where we landed up, landed and connecting with this partner and Skedgo um, is that platform that we're utilizing. And so uh, we also are utilizing technology vendors out of Canada, which is Spare or iCabby out of Ireland, um, and then using the GTFS feed, which is in Google Transit. And so we literally, you know, knowing what the challenges were, talking with Amy, talking with transportation providers, brought this technology forward based upon what the agencies were saying the need was, not saying, well, here's how the technology works. You should change business to fit the, the app. It's the app needs to fit the agency. And we're really taking a human-centered design approach to the technology rollout and the deployment, ensuring that the app is accessible, that the buttons make sense, that the color is right, that it's um, you know, enlargeable for font and those kind of things. The other thing that we're integrating with this for rural areas is this uh, addressing system called What Three Words. Um, they've divided the entire Earth's surface into three meter squares, and every three meter square is an address. And so many times when you're going to a hospital in an urban area, it's like, which door do I drop somebody off at? Or if I'm going into a rural area, for example, we see this in some communities, especially like um, in trailer parks at night, if I'm trying to pick somebody up for a third shift job or something like that, where am I going? Sometimes street lighting isn't there or I'm in a rural area and Google Maps isn't accurate. So what three words is currently being um, utilized predominantly in the emergency response industry. I think LA just launched a pilot using that technology and we're integrating it into our um, platform to ensure that you can get exactly where you need to go within three feet of accuracy with your pickup and drop off. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so the layers of mobility integration that's available really depends on the agency. So a lot of the agencies are in a place where they're using technology that has um, where they're, uh, you know, able to track the trips and those kind of things, but they're not using an app in the vehicle. Um, and sometimes they have another app that they're already using that they've integrated. And so what we did is we said, well, we can meet you wherever you're at and wherever you're comfortable. So throughout the entire app, you can um, plan for trips within fixed route, paratransit, deviated fixed route, demand response or volunteer transportation is all available, pick up and drop off times in one place. Um, throughout all but one, you're able to also request a trip on the app. There's one agency that says, well, let's just see if anybody calls me from it first. And then if I get some calls, then I'll go to this next step. But where you can request a trip and receive reminders about your scheduled trips. Some agencies say you don't need to pay on the bus. They can pay on the app. And some of the agencies are using technology that will allow the passengers to see the vehicle arrive in real time, almost like an Uber experience. And so, again, with the technology, meeting the agencies where they're at, they're dealing with bigger issues right now with, with all the things that are going on with COVID. And many of our organizations, as you saw, our senior centers, some of them are managed by departments of public health. And so while they're integrate, while they're supporting their community and doing the, all these incredible things, they're joining us as partners saying, here's where I'm at right now. And if the service expands, maybe I'll add the ability to pay through the app, or maybe I'll add the ability to see the vehicle in real time. But as we get started, this is where we're at. And we're incredibly comfortable with that. And we feel that that's um, a decision that the agency and the organization makes based upon the resources and the interest um, and where they're at. Uh, next slide, please. This is an example of the app um, in the interface, looking at some of the screenshots where um, in the app, you can decide what options you want to see. Do you want to see bike directions? Do you want to see taxis? Do you want to see walking directions? Um, if you use a wheelchair, do you want to see if there's data in the um, on if the sidewalks are accessible? And then you can add lots of favorites. So we know a lot of folks, especially working with seniors and the individuals who use um, paratransit on a frequent basis, a lot of times there's there's um, redundancy in trip patterns, right? Every day I get up and I go to work and then I pick up the kids from school and then I come home. Those same favorites can make using the app easier, especially if you use a screen reader. It just makes that um, time to use the app very, very um, convenient. And then if you don't need a car instruction or you don't want walking instructions, it's not going to show up. Up. But if you're trying to decide, do I take public transit or maybe could I take a taxi or an Uber? I want to see those two options and see how long it's going to take me, what the difference is and what the cost difference is. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's an example of some detailed instructions in the app where you can get turn by turn uh, what the what the directions are, what the terminals are, how many stops, how long the wait will be, detailed instructions on the bus, those kind of things. So uh, we really wanted to make sure that the um, the app showed multiple options for individuals who are utilizing the service. Uh, next slide, please. And this is an example of what that looks like if you're accessing it through the website. So then you again, you see that same level of detail. You have one click to re, uh, add it to your favorites or remove it from your favorites. You can share a trip. Um, you can see we still have the um, the detailed instructions. You can ask to see the timetable um, and you can zoom in and you can zoom out of this as much as you need to. Next slide, please. Uh, from a timeline perspective, right now we're um, we deployed the MOS technology. We're um, in alpha stage, which means we're internally testing it before we roll it out to our partners because we want to make sure what we sh what we're sharing with our partners is effective and works versus them finding the bugs. Uh, we had our first mobility leadership circle meeting a couple of weeks ago. We had almost 50 folks in attendance and just had a really um, great conversation around issues such as dialysis transportation and how is the Medicaid transportation working. And uh, we also talked about driver shortages. And so really just this is a time when um, individuals across the state come together specifically to talk about transportation challenges and mobility issues, and it's completely welcome. So I know I've heard transportation come up a couple of times on the call today. And so anybody who's interested in joining that, our next meeting is in October. But it's a time to come together to bring up ideas or challenges and how we can meet those needs. Um, 
our next thing that we're doing is deploying the services in the community, um, testing those out with the transportation providers in August, and we'll probably leave, that'll go into September. We're working on um, promotional materials, and we're also doing these multilingual to ensure we're meeting Title VI um, um, requirements, but also making sure everybody in the community who needs to utilize the public transportation or is using these services in the community um, have them available. Uh, we're going to be deploying the technology to a small number of individuals at first. Uh, we call these our early adopters in September and October to make sure that um, we are um, making sure before we deploy it to a, a larger population, we don't run into any bugs or any confusion in terms of the user experience. Um, we have that second mobility leadership circle, and then we're going to deploy it to the public. And then in November, do a major PR push for utilization. So there's some, you know, road road miles, if you will, on the app before we're really shouting from the mountaintops, download this app, check it out, because it's available. It'll be available for free in the app store for anybody to use. And then December doing reflections and lessons learned. So we have kind of a breakneck pace to get this out the door. Um, and then looking forward in 2022, we're going to continue those uh, mobility leadership meetings on a quarterly basis. We're going to create a guide for mobility management and a coordination plan. Um, one of the really cool things about this technology out of Australia is they have what's called a mobility wallet. So for individuals who are going to substance use disorder counseling or maybe somebody who is going to another type of treatment or maybe job access or whatever that may be, you can put funds on their account and see the funds utilized um, in a in a budget if way if you will so you can ensure they're getting to their resources um, and also in 2022 we're doing those really important aspects of risk management protocols um, creating more detailed training materials for uh, consistency as the program grows and continues as we receive funding from Nevada DOT to add the remaining five um, counties in 2023 and 2024. We're always going to be doing bug and customer support and feature request management and then getting into those um, reporting needs, putting together those wonderful white papers and then doing a webinar highlighting the outcomes in 2023. Go ahead, next slide. Really quick in a nutshell, we're going to continue those mobility leadership meetings. Um, as I said earlier, we're going to be expanding this app, this app statewide, um, integrating Uber and Lyft as an option. So in addition to the public transit and the taxis and the senior centers and the nonprofits and those kind of things, Uber and Lyft will also be available in the package. Um, and then rolling out push notifications. So if there's a state agency that wants to say, hey, there's new services available, every app level, every app user can get an update. This is check out our new X, Y, and Z. Or if you need help, call this number. I could see that with the, the new number that's rolling out for uh, mental health services. Um, promotional officer promotional offers so if you want to offer discounts for certain types of services um, with different packages that's available as well as agenda and calendar integration to get that in your app if you're riding the bus or you booked a ride it'll show up in your app and then adding subscription packages so just really sophisticated exciting mobility options are coming ahead with this platform and phoenix is really excited to be able to to bring this um, next slide so thank you so much for your time. I know I sped through that, but I tried to give kind of the Coles Notes version of um, the program and, and our goals and our mission. And final slide has my contact information on it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you Valerie. Valerie. This is Diane. Um, are there any questions? All right, this is Diane again, hearing none. Um, thank you for all of the present presentations that we had today. Are you guys hearing the bizarre echo? Yes. I don't know why. Oh, is it gone? That's better. Okay, <laughs> I did not do anything. Um, Thank you for all the presenters' presentations today. We got a wealth of information. Um, I want to thank Connie and her staff for organizing all of this. I think it's going to, at least speaking just for myself, I'm going to find it really useful as we move through um, the year in between our funding cycles to really pinpoint where our funding is most needed for the state. Um, so thank you for that.
Um, are there, let's move on to agenda item um, number eight, other information items. I don't have anything. Do, Connie, any I, other? This is Connie. I, I do have um, just something, well, well, just a reminder, if you folks um, have some topics that you would prefer to see in the future, please, please let us know. Um, secondary, um, the office has created so I'm sure you're all familiar with the grant management listserv, our units listserv. Um, it, it, it's used to disperse a lot of information, um, but what we're wanting, what we have done is created a listserv that is specific to GMAC, to the Grants Management Advisory Committee. Um, so we will be sending out an email um, to their current listserv, um, introducing the GMAC listserv and asking folks that would like, like to have messaging specific to your, your committee meetings and, and information, um, join that listserv as well, because we will no longer be using um, the, the, our, our current um, listserv for GMAC. Um, um, and just a reminder that our next meeting is October 21st from 10 a.m. to noon. And that's that's all I have. Thank you guys so much. Connie, this is Diane. Are we going to, given the state of shifting in-person virtual, are we, is the plan to continue virtual meetings? At this time, I have been asked to continue the virtual meeting platform. Perfect. Excellent. I, I have found it. Um, Oops, excuse me, I have found it quite uh, a lot easier to manage in my daily comings and goings. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Very convenient. Agreed. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to agenda item number nine, our second round of public comment. I will open the floor to public comment. Diane, this is Shirley. I, I just want to. Um, say that I agree with you um, because I live in Pahrump I have to travel an hour an hour a little over an hour to get to Vegas to have the meetings and sometimes meetings are 45 minutes so um, I'm gone three hours <laughs> in order to get to a 45 minute meeting so I've really appreciated all of this even with the little glitches that we've had because even if I can call in it's still better so thank you Thank you, Shirley. I completely agree with that. Even though I don't have to travel, it's nice not to have to even think about it. <laughs> Just calendaring, calendaring, calendaring that into my day. All right, any other public comment? All right, hearing none, um, we will move to adjourn as, um, Connie just said our next meeting is in October. All right, thank you everybody. Um, and we will see you in a couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.